Well, good morning to everyone who's joined so far. Um, I guess I'd better start since it's two minutes past 10. Um, people are still joining, but um, here's the schedule of the um, biophysical techniques talks. And as you can see, uh, we're up to talk number six, and I'm going to talk today about um, single molecule spectroscopy as advertised. But in fact, um, I've actually um, changed the title of the talk because um, historically in the LMB, we've had in the biophysics facilities, at least we've had access to um, a single molecule spectroscopy setup. Um, and so the talk was so named, but uh, recently we've acquired a couple more um, um, instruments that are technically not um, spectrometers. So I've renamed the talk as single molecule techniques. And then with the um, caveat of these are techniques that we have in the, in the biophysics facilities. Um, so the talk's going to be divided into um, two sections. First of all, an overview of why single molecule techniques might be useful in your research. And then in the second half of the talk, I'll describe these um, techniques which we have available in a biophysics facility, giving you some background to how the techniques work, um, how you would actually practically use them, and hopefully um, some examples of where they've proved to be useful in uh, during research and uh, in the context of people that work in the LMB you probably go around the building particularly the people who have joined recently students and you see a lot of these um, signs telling you not to enter certain rooms and so obviously a lot of these single molecule techniques in fact all of them are based around um, uh, the use of lasers in in some form and um, so many of these techniques are hidden away in these rooms um, where people don't really know what's going on. So um, in addition, there's an element of empowering people to know what's actually um, happening in the building. Um, I'm struggling to advance. Oh, there we are. Advance my slides. Got it. OK, so um, when you think about other things that you do um, in your research here in the, um, at the LMB or elsewhere, um, if you think about common um, techniques that you do, such as some sort of purification, um, running a gel, or perhaps measuring um, a fluorescent spectrum um, on a fluorescent spectrometer. So if you consider a 25 um, kilodalton protein, um, the typical use of uh, materials in these techniques is on the order of milligrams, micrograms, and lower. And if you actually then work out how many molecules um, you're involving in this experiment, um, it's really rather a lot of molecules um, that are um, being utilized. And so the question one might ask is, um, why would you want to make any measurement potentially billions of times harder uh, by reducing the number of molecules that you're involving in the uh, measurement um, to uh, single digits? And of course, um, the answer is that whenever we make um, an ensemble measurement, such as the techniques on the previous slide, what we're going to observe is an average property of all the molecules that we're observing. Um, whereas if you actually measure single molecules, then you can, of course, see properties of each individual molecule. Um, and these will then reveal what is going on in the ensemble um, distribution of molecules. And in fact, if you look here, you can see that um, an ensemble measurement would give um, this particular molecular property here, which would be the average. But this average could arise from a variety of different situations where you had a very uh, narrow distribution of material um, with the property at that average. You had a very broad distribution of um, properties which generated that average. You had two distinct populations that would then um, generate this average. And also within that, um, all of these scenarios, you could have small amounts of um, other material, um, so-called rare, you know, a rare confirmation. Um, so um, 
this is a huge um, benefit of making single molecule measurements. And then when we then include time as a, an additional uh, measurement parameter, we can also reveal uh, mechanistic um, dynamics of individual molecules. So when we consider these in um, an ensemble, they're obviously all unsynchronized. And, the, and so the um, stochastic mechanistic dynamics would average out. And then if we continue to observe with time, or perhaps we have a, a reaction which we can induce or we change the conditions under which we're measuring, we can, by using single molecule measurements, get direct mechanistic information. And one of the very challenging things for me measuring in an ensemble is to find out the order of events. And so in this case, sorry, in this case, you can see that um, um, this particular um, um, transition between these two molecular properties occasionally has um, an intermediate, which would be an, uh, classified as being on pathway. Um, and that would be extremely difficult to um, observe using an ensemble method. So then you might ask the question, well, if I look at one molecule, just as if you looked at um, I, um, any population, would that um, actual molecule be typical of the behavior of the system that I'm interested in? So there's a principle, principle known as the ergodic principle, and this really um, is fairly straightforward in, in just stating that if you average a lot of molecules, um, which is an ensemble spatial average or so-called um, bulk measurement, that's the same as averaging the behavior of individual single molecules, but observing them for a long period of time in a temporal average or many individual single molecules, each for a short time, in which case you're averaging the behavior um, of single molecules. So um, typically when we talk about single molecule measurements um, in, in biology, um, and in solution, we're not usually talking about being able to measure or observe single molecules for sufficiently long time to recapitulate an ensemble average. Um, what we're normally doing is looking at many, many single molecules and observing them for a um, short period of time. And this is because um, the molecules are diffusing and we might also have um, um, photophysics um, or, or bleaching of our fluorescent labels that we require to be able to um, observe the molecules. But despite measuring um, a lot of molecules and then averaging them, the properties of the molecules are observed one molecule at a time. So it's still a single molecule measurement. So here I'm being slightly controversial in suggesting that actually there are a lot of um, techniques around that you might not have thought about for observing single molecules. Well, obviously um, there are um, is cryo EM, which is direct observation method, and and you are in fact um, observing single um, particles. Um, this is giving you a snapshot um, of um, what um, the structure of the particle. You could also consider um, X-ray or, or the growth of um, crystals to be a single molecule, but ordered in a specific um, orientation in a, in a lattice. There are obviously very many molecules, but they're all aligned in exactly the same way. Then we have techniques that have been described in uh, the fourth talk um, in the series, um, classed under super res resolution microscopy. Technically, these are not um, a molecular uh, resolution and also they require um, fixation. Then we have uh, a group of techniques, single molecule techniques, which are in solution techniques. These are the um, techniques I'm gonna talk about today. And in these methods, we have freely diffusing. Um, sometimes we also have immobilized molecules, but generally they're all undergoing stochastic and mechanistic dynamics during our measurement. And we can also, in addition um, to observing these dynamics, make the measurements under very biologically relevant and controlled conditions of solvent um, and temperature. 
So just to then emphasize um, why dynamics might be important, if you think about um, some beautiful and very elegant um, structures that, that can be produced, as you can see on the left, um, from X-ray crystallography or, or um, cryo-EM, and then a super resolution image of cellular architecture. Um, really what we still need to consider and always remember when we're looking at the um, structure activity relations with these molecules is that actually in the real world, we have elements of diffusion and uh, molecular crowding within the cell. And in addition to that, the individual particles are undergoing a whole range of dynamics and movement on, on a, a very, very wide range of timescales. And being able to access this diffusion and dynamics is an important part of understanding um, the system that we're interested in. So what kind of strategies might you use to um, make uh, um, single molecule um, measurements? The first thing that you would probably think of is if I only want to see one molecule, then I should just dilute my sample um, to very, very low level. And in fact, that is the case. So typically um, we have to reduce the concentration of our observation um, sample to picomolar or nanomole kind of concentrations. Um, this has some advantage in that um, you only need a very small amount of material um, to um, make a large number of measurements. We could also consider limiting the observation volume, so we might use a diffraction limited confocal configuration to our observation um, optics, and this would reduce the observed volume down to femtoliters or so. And it also rejects any out of plane um, fluorescence signal. We could also use turf illumination, um, which if you remember from the earlier talks, restricts the illumination um, in the evanescent wave to a depth of about 50 to 100 nanometers. And then we would then localize the system of interest into this area where the evanescent wave was present. Another strategy for single molecule is to use very strong optical signals. So to get as much um, signal as we can from our individual single molecules, this requires the use of very um, bright fluorescent uh, labels often with high quantum efficiency. Um, and these we might consider exciting at visible or longer wavelengths just to try and keep down scattering, which has an inverse um, wavelength dependence. The other thing then to get as much um, signal as we can from our system is to use very strong illumination, normally using a laser. Um, and the problem with this is that we can induce both um, a variety of complicated photophysics within the uh, uh, structure or the chem chemistry of the fluorophore, or we can get photo, photo bleaching. Um, and another strategy, um, since we are going to make these kind of measurements, is we might consider using multiple wavelengths of different lasers to try and probe the um, system um, in different ways at, at, at the same time. So some practicalities that result from those kind of strategies that you might use. Um, the first one, which is probably the most important, is that when you start considering adding extrinsic fluorescent labels onto your system, um, these may in fact perturb the system um, or undergo these photophysics that I described at, um, um, at high illumination intensity. And for, as a result, um, single molecule techniques typically require large numbers of controls to be performed to um, dissect out what we're observing. So for purified materials, if you're um, studying pure protein, then a single fluorophore at a single defined labeling site is definitely the cleanest approach to these techniques. And this may require some form of mutagenesis um, or a fusion protein possibly, um, as, as described by Ben in the third talk, um, there are many, many strategies to including these labels into your protein. 
The instrumentation that you're going to use to make these measurements can be very complex, especially um, if the um, platform is made in a sort of homemade or a, a lab built um, setup. And these um, kind of setups require a lot of expertise to build and to keep them running um, and obtaining optimal data. Another point to um, the very low concentrations that you may be using, which is not an advantage, is that um, under these very low concentrations, it may not be possible to allow um, stable complex formation. Um, and if you're interested in studying a specific uh, multi-molecular complex, you have to um, be certain that it will remain intact at, at kind of nanomole concentrations. There's also um, a problem that um, you may lose material and or see altered diffusion times because of um, surface absorption. When you have micromolar or higher concentrations of your samples, you are probably not aware that every container that you put your sample into, be it plastic or glass, um, probably ends up with a coating on its surface of your molecule of interest. You just obviously don't notice that at higher concentrations, but when you start to work at nanomole or picomole concentrations, this can definitely be a problem. Another um, issue to consider is that, um, particularly where you wish to um, observe systems for longer periods of time, is you may require to immobilize um, your system. Um, and um, this, again, may perturb the system. So you're going to need more controls to make sure that um, that's not a problem. So the underlining um, uh, message of all of these um, practical difficulties, which one way against the advantages of the techniques, is that single molecule approaches um, must be a logical approach to answer a specific question um, and be aimed at um, answering that um, tractable question in, in, a, in a useful way for your research. So we've come, or I've discussed um, several times, the fact that um, with single molecule techniques, you can um, look at freely diffusing um, systems, or you can think about immobilizing your systems in some way. So then we, if we're thinking about um, studying our molecules completely in solution in, and, and able to freely diffuse, then we need to also consider time scales in that confocal volume is a micrometer or so and therefore uh, the transit time through that will be on the order of milliseconds depending on the viscosity the molecular size and your optical configuration that you're using so in this way high illumination intensities can be tolerated and photo bleaching tends not to be a problem for these very short transit times uh, when you have longer time scales, you have to immobilize on a, on a surface or on an immobilized biological scaffold. And when you think about um, the microscopy approaches that were described in the earlier torch, talks, which are utilized within single molecule techniques, then a confocal approach can target either diffusing or localized systems while turf illumination is, is used with um, surface capture. So having talked about diffusion, it's just interesting as a tangential um, um, sideline just to think about um, what is the timescales for stochastic diffusion um, within an observation volume. So you, there is a simple formula to calculate the time taken on average to, tra to traverse a distance x. And this is related to a property in a molecule, the translational diffusion coefficient which typically for a 30 kilodalton protein is about 10 microns squared per second in cytoplasm. So for three-dimensional diffusion, you can see that the time scale for diffusion um, along the length of a, an E. coli is about 10 to 20 milliseconds. The time of diffusion for this protein across the HeLa cell, it's about 20 microns, is on the order of 10 seconds. 
However, when we start to get up to larger cells like neuronal cells, then potentially to randomly diffuse um, across one centimeter would take about 20 days. Um, and then obviously when you come up to considering even larger cells such as the sciatic nerve, the time scale of diffusion is absolutely enormous. And this is, is an interesting um, way of um, understanding why um, the larger cells have to organize their cellular machinery and have intracellular transport um, mechanisms. So for a typical confocal um, observation point, the point spread function is about one micron. And so the diffusion time um, is about two, uh, two milliseconds or so. Um, this is because um, in buffer, um, typically diffusion is about an order of magnitude greater than it would be in, in cytoplasm. So if we then consider um, um, being able to count um, photons from our fluorophore at a rate of about 10 kilohertz. This means that within those two milliseconds, we're only going to count 20 excess photons. So again, underlining the point that these very fast diffusion times mean that single molecule uh, measurements can be very, very technically challenging. So, here are the single molecule um, techniques which we have um, specifically within the, uh, or uh, which are mentored within the LMB biophysics facility. So I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to describe these three different um, techniques in the remainder of the talk. Um, so um, the first one is a lab built um, single molecule spectroscopy um, confocal based instrument. And this is used for measuring uh, freely diffusing systems, or that's how we've used it in the past. And we've um, arranged so that we can either do fluctuation correlation spectroscopy, known as FCS, and this is measuring diffusional times of molecules and can look at interactions as well, but it can also access um, intra-chain time resolved dynamics on a very fast time scale, which I will um, describe shortly. Um, this particular um, spectroscopy system can also measure um, FRET, um, and we have two um, different options to measure, and this would be um, a classic technique to study um, populations or distances um, within your system. The second technique that I'll describe um, comes from a company known as Refine, and it's called um, ISCAT, and this is a label-free interferometric scattering based instrument and in this technique um, we observe events that occur on a, um, a glass liquid interface and these events generate scattering and this contrast in the observed signal generated can be used to determine the mass of the particle landing at that surface and finally i will describe briefly um, a, a recent addition to the facility which is the Lumix um, C-Trap. This is based around an optical tweezers system. And the instrument that we have is a dual tra trap instrument. And, and this can be used to look at force extension or force clamp measurements. And it has additional imaging capability um, using wide field turf or, or reflection microscopy. I would also point out, um, particularly people in the LMB, there are many other um, lab built or commercially built um, confocal or turf based microscope systems that are often particularly used by individual groups. Um, and I'm not going to describe those or, or I probably am not aware of all of the systems that are in the building. And uh, just to mention that there is also an atomic force microscope um, which could be used for um, pulling or tapping based um, force measurements. But again, I won't be describing that at all. So to come on to the first uh, of these techniques, this is the configuration of the um, instrument that we have. And as you can see here, we have a variety of different lasers that we can use to excite our fluorophore at different wavelengths. 
um, and these are coupled into a, a fiber optic. Um, we then collimate the beam um, and then um, pass it into the um, objective lens of an inverted um, confocal base, or, or sorry, an inverted uh, microscope with a high NA objective lens. Um, and then we have two options, either to collect light, the, and we have a, here is the confocal um, pinhole on either side of the um, instrument. So we can exit the, um, or oh, sorry, collect the um, photons either um, using a prism within the microscope that will switch the collected light into two different collection areas. Um, in one side, we have um, two APDs, which um, receive the light uh, approximately 50% each using a beam splitter. This is used for FCS. And then on the other side of the uh, microscope, we have a dichroic that will fractionate the uh, donor and uh, accept a wavelengths of light. So here's some pictures of the um, actual instrument. And in fact, um, behind me on this side, you can just see uh, the eyepiece of the microscope as I'm um, talking from this confocal room today. Um, how do you, uh, what, 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 how would you uh, put a sample onto this instrument? Well, there are uh, um, many ways. It's based around a standard inverted microscope. So it's compatible with any buffer pretty well. Um, and we can use a variety of sample holders. The ones that we've used um, in the past tend to be these tech trays, um, which have eight positions and take about 200 microliters of sample. We can also use standard um, dimple slides. These take about 20 microliters. The trays are quite nice in that you can um, passivate them with um, a variety of um, substances. Uh, we use polylysine quite a bit, but you can also use um, BSA to passivate surfaces, um, or, uh, or that can be included in your buffer as a sacrificial protein to kind of coat the glass surface. The, as I said, the trays are particularly good in that they're easy to passivate um, on the bench and they don't require any fancy um, um, setup. And they're also useful in that you can uh, make additions into them. Um, during the measurement, so you can initiate reactions and so forth. So I'll talk about FCS first, and FCS is fluctuation correlation spectroscopy. Um, and so what um, we're interested in doing is analyzing or measuring and analyzing these fluctuations. So molecules that are passing um, in and out of the confocal observation volume will cause fluctuations in our fluorescence signal at the detectors. If you remember, we have two, two detectors um, fed via a beam splitter. And these fluctuations can be analyzed using a process or a mathematical um, um, method called autocorrelation. And what this essentially does is, is look at the similarity of the signal as a function of um, increasing time. So we can um, look at the fluctuation at time t, we can look at the fluctuation at um, T plus some sort of offset. Um, and then this is normalized by the global average of the signal. So as we progressively increase the um, offset in time to longer and longer times, then the correlation between the original fluctuation and the offset fluctuation no longer ex exists. So what we end up with um, is a um, a declining function that will go from uh, a value of one at time zero to zero for um, or zero correlation um, um, at very long times of um, offset. So fortunately uh, for us, there are um, hardware correlators um, and these are able to do all of this uh, mathematical calculation in real time. Um, and um, they also um, have the option to um, look at cross correlation, which is very useful in the APDs have a, a property known as after pulsing. And, and by looking at cross correlation, um, we can um, get an autocorrelation function of the signal, which is correlated between the two. 
channels and obviously the after pulsing in these two channels is not in any way synchronized so will not um, correlate um, and this allows us to access sub microsecond um, time domains as you'll see in a minute we could also consider doing two color fcs so we would um, um, use two different illumination um, or wavelengths and then collect the data with some sort of dichroic um, and then we can look at cross correlation um, so we selectively only observe particles that are carrying both colors of fluorophores so if you're thinking about looking at an interaction for example you can selectively observe only the molecules that are interacted um, and there is also a technique known as inverse fcs where you study unlabeled um, objects such as vesicles or molecular structures um, in a very dilute solution of a, a fluorophore. In that case, the uh, fluctuation that you get is not an increase in photons, but a decrease coming from the fact that an unlabeled uh, particle passes through the observation volume. So then when we collect the data from these two channels, we get um, an intensity plot. And within um, this intensity as a function of time, we have fluctuations. These are analyzed using autocorrelation. But the average intensity plot can tell us a few things about, um, we can see bleaching going on, we can see quenching, um, and we can consider also the labeling efficiency of our, our molecules um, in the, um, the intensity or the fluorescence intensity will correlate with the number of molecules um, uh, sorry the number of fluorophores that are on our, our molecule and then we analyze the autocorrelation function uh, mathematically um, to give a translational diffusion time this is basically here here is an example of a, a measured autocorrelation function and here the translational diffusion time is about 0.8 um, milliseconds we're also able to extract the number of particles on average that we have um, in the observation volume um, at any one time. This is because it's a Poissonian process. Um, and um, so we're able to extract this term one over N, which is the um, number of particles. And so that means ironically that the, the amplitude of the autocorrelation function becomes bigger the fewer molecules we have in the observation volumes. In this case, you can see that we have about 90 molecules on average um, in the observation volume, but um, we can work at much lower levels or we can work uh, at somewhat higher. The important point though, is that the, the fluctuations that are generated by the diffusion of individual molecules are not in any way correlated. So what we're observing is an individual single molecule property, although we're actually measuring with uh, more than one molecule in our observation window at any one point. Um, another thing we can do is during the diffusion of our molecule through the observation volume, we will get additional, or we may well get additional fluctuations in the intensity of the fluorescence. And these fluctuations in a technique known as PET FCS come about because of Van der Waals contact between um, a, a, a number of chemistries that are used in um, extrinsic fluorophores, but particularly the oxazine based um, fluorophores. And these are quenched when they you have Van der Waals contact between the fluorophore and tryptophan in your structure or guanine if you're looking at nucleic acid and as a result of um, this quenching you can get when you have intrachain dynamics going on within your system you will get additional fluctuations during the diffusion process so here in green you can see a simple diffusion where the molecule passes through there are no additional fluctuations and um, on this faster time scale we see a constant value. Here we can see additional an additional um, kinetic or a dynamic occurring, which results from additional um, intrachain movement, um, causing um, this these fluctuations in our um, signal. And here's an example of how we use that 
here at the LMB, and this comes from work on a uh, bicyclic um, therapeutic peptide. And this was done in the early um, days before um, this technology was commercialized um, and into the company Bicycle Therapeutics. But these um, bicyclic peptides have this um, thiol chemistry, which leads to this sort of figure of eight conformation. And they had um, evolved um, this particular sequence um, where you can see it here in a linear form, which is uh, an inhibitor of calicrinin. And um, what they were interested in was having a look by NMR about whether or not um, the bicyclic um, peptide had additional structure. And this is one of the arguments that um, these bicycle peptides are much better therapeutic vehicles because they are more structured and therefore less resistant to, uh, sorry, more resistant to proteolysis. And in addition, there's always an, a thermodynamic argument that the fact that they're more structured means that the uh, loss in conformational entropy is reduced when they bind and interact uh, with their target, meaning that their affinities may well be higher. Under NM, um, NMR conditions, though, they were unable to see any NOEs, uh, which would be supporting some form of structure. So here you can see, initially we looked, uh, you can see in red the dye, which is um, uh, one of these oxazine fluorophores. We were studying the dye alone here. You can see when this dye is added onto this linear peptide, you can see that the diffusion of the um, of the peptide is slower. It takes a longer time to diffuse through the confocal volume than the dye alone. When we consider this linear peptide, we see a massive additional um, intra-chain dynamic, which is caused, caused by the ability of this oxazine fluorophore to have van der Waals contact with this um, tryptophan. Obviously, as a linear peptide, it's unstructured. And the time scale of these fluctuations on the order of 100 nanoseconds or so was consistent in the literature with um, separation of about seven residues um, between these two groups, although uh, somewhat more complicated because there's a proline um, in the middle. But it's on the, on the right order of um, um, time scale for that process. When we look at the bicyclic peptide seen here in green, we can see that the diffusion um, of that is pretty well identical to the linear peptide, suggesting they're roughly the same hydrodynamic um, radius when they diffuse. But when we look at the additional intrachain dynamics, um, we see that unlike the dye, where there are obviously no, nothing happening, there are still some moderate but slower um, intrachain dynamics, suggesting that even though we have this bicyclic structure, the dye is able to contact the tryptophan. And this was in a way sufficient to explain this, adi this additional flexibility this was um, sufficient at least to make the argument that that was why um, NOEs were not detected. So coming on to FRET, which we measure with the same um, setup as before, but using a dichroic rather than a beam splitter. In the, it, when, when one does a, um, a confocal based uh, FRET measurement, what you end up with is um, a signal um, where we again effectively get fluctuations. But in this case, we dilute the sample even more than we would with FCS, where we were able to have 50 to 100 molecules in the observation volume at a time. In this case, we want to have um, zero or one molecule in the observation volume. So what we end up with is again, fluctuations in our signal, but we analyze those uh, as a function of time by defining um, events as being a burst of photons that we collect in the detector. So we have to um, add together the donor channel and the acceptor channel and define some level of photons that we classify as a burst. Um, and we can average that over some kind of a time scale, for example, a couple, couple of hundred microseconds. 
define the burst threshold, and then we then analyze the threat efficiency of each burst event um, by just looking at the number of photons coming from the acceptor divided by the total number of photons from donor and acceptor, which is our burst size. And this threat efficiency allows us to construct a threat histogram um, from many events or many diffusional events through the observation volume. One of the issues with measuring threat is that you quite commonly get a large zero peak implying zero threat efficiency. So what this could be interpreted as meaning is that the donor and the acceptor are beyond um, a distance where threat can occur, which is typically 10 nanometers or so, but it could also arise because some of your molecules are only labeled with the donor and therefore they, they are unable to threat to the acceptor, the acceptor is missing. And so in more sophisticated configurations of um, single molecule threat measurement, there are various methods that you can use to eliminate this zero peak. Why would you want to do that? Well, the possibility is that the um, population of molecules that you're interested in have a low threat or close to zero threat. So therefore you want to be able to eliminate any of the counts that arise from this um, spurious, um, these um, spurious counts that come from the donor only um, molecules. So here's an example of how we used FRET using the system that we have here in the um, LMB. In this case, uh, we haven't eliminated the zero peak. Um, we don't, so this was just a basic um, experiment. And this um, particular experiment was um, designed to address the question about um, a, or a question about protein folding, whether it was barrier limited, meaning that there was a transition state between natively folded and um, denatured molecules, or whether there was a continuum of um, states existing between the um, native state and the denatured state, and meaning that um, there were intermediate structures which represented partially unfolded um, molecules. This was particularly um, pertinent to the protein folding community at a time when computer simulation was able to study um, folding trajectories for small proteins over very short periods of time. And so the experimental community started to measure small proteins that folded extremely fast. And one of the um, outcomes of so-called landscape theory of protein folding is that you can predict that under certain circumstances, you would see this gradual accretion of structure and not a barrier limited two state mechanism. So we were arguing at great length um, with another group about whether or not um, this model or this model applied. And so we used single molecule fret and um, using a denaturant to perturb the free energy between folded and, and denatured molecules. As we started to add the denaturant, in this case, guanidinium hydrochloride, um, you see initially you have a high fret species corresponding to the native state where the fluorophore, the two, um, the donor and the acceptor are close together. And then as we add denaturant, we start to see a shoulder in this peak. And then eventually that resolves into clearly two peaks, which would be consistent with this barrier limited mechanism, i.e. native and then another species, which represented the denatured molecule at lower threat. And then eventually if you add a large amount of denaturant, you end up with the um, fully denatured um, population. So this supported this barrier limited model and um, did not support at all this um, continuum model. So here are a few further examples of work that we've done with the instrument here in the room with me. Um, and you can take a look at those if you're interested. So the second technique I want to talk about um, is this um, interferometric scattering based um, instrument known as uh, the ISCAP. 
So the way that this technique works is that um, what we do is um, look at macromolecules, um, and this is not only applicable to proteins, it can be used um, to study virtually any, any type of um, particle. Um, when they're in solution and they approach and land at a glass um, surface, they will um, scatter light. Um, and some of that scattering can be, um, is going to um, go in the direction of the incident light. Um, and this can be optimized to interfere with the light, which is reflected directly from this glass liquid interface. And this um, um, optimization requires some fancy um, optics and a very um, sophisticated instrument. Um, but what the company have been able to do is to use um, numerical aperture filtering um, of the total reflected signal. And this allows contrast gener generated by individual single molecules to be measured. And this contrast that you see here from in this movie of this event, where um, the interference is occurring here, the intensity of this dark spot, this contrast, scales linearly with mass. And so we can determine macromolecular mass. Um, and if we measure a lot of um, these events, we can obviously get population heterogeneity. So the instrument uses a camera and a fairly large field of view. And so this allows many events to be collected on this camera with a large field of view fairly rapidly in only one minute or so acquisition of data. And um, light scattering, which is the property that we're measuring here is universal uh, property of proteins and also all pretty well all other macromolecules that we might be interested in um, in, in, in the structural biology area. And it's a function of their polarizability. And I'll talk more about that um, in the lecture on light scattering. But the important point to emphasize therefore is that light scat, uh, sorry, ice scat is a universal technique um, and it requires no labels. So you can just walk up to the instrument and in principle be able to measure immediately. Here's the um, instrument um, that we have here at the LMB um, and the practicalities of it are that we typically use about 10 microliter of sample and this sample is placed onto a very clean um, cover slip and you can do this um, either using a gasket, which is applied onto the cover slip, generating a small well, or I've also done it using, by just applying the drop directly onto the um, glass surface. There's an oil objective lens underneath, and with the laser illumination and the collection of reflected light, and then the interfering scattered light, we end up with um, a, um, field of view of about three by 10 microns. And within that field of view, the pixels that are displayed have a, a size of about 80 nanometers square. Um, and so these are able to capture diffraction limited um, events. You might notice here that you see a sort of white ring around the dark um, into uh, the high contrast areas. This is the airy ring that has been described by Nick um, and um, John in their talks on um, um, imaging. So here you can see uh, at the bottom, this movie um, is showing you what a typical experiment might look like. Um, and um, during the acquisition, we see um, these events occurring across the uh, whole area of the field of view. And many landing events can be observed um, during that one minute. The frames um, in the movie are then averaged at a, a rate of five to one and a running ratio is calculated. And this ratio compares um, the first five frames with the next five frame average. Um, and this so-called ratio metric view um, 
is uh, used to observe or generate the, these kind of movies. What that means is that the molecules, as they land on the glass surface, that they appear, uh, they land, and then they apparently disappear um, during the movie. And this is mainly because once they stick down onto the glass surface, they're in the frame, the, uh, the frame average before and after the time point in the movie that you're considering. Um, so therefore the rage, they disappear. You can get leaving events, which would generate a white um, event surrounded by a dark ring, uh, but these are much less common as, and as I described earlier, uh, most materials will stick to glass um, very, very efficiently, um, although it's not always obvious in, in most experiments. The contrast that's generated is negative since the instrument is optimized to give destructive interference. Um, multiple events can occur in the movie at the same position. That's because the molecular size is typically a lot smaller than the um, image resolution um, that we're seeing in the movie. And the software um, that comes with the instrument analyzes these movies and it looks at discrete and non-overlapping events. And then it evaluates the maximum contrast that's generated by these um, landing events. And this contrast scales very linearly with molecular mass. Here you can see a variety of proteins showing the mass against the um, generated contrast. So mass can be determined from the calibration of the instrument using um, uh, um, some uh, proteins or the molecule that you're interested in of known molecular weight. The lower limit for mass determination is about 50 kilodaltons. And the upper limit, well, we haven't really explored that, but it's certainly um, two megadaltons or beyond. If you want to look at nucleic acids or modified proteins, such as glycosylated proteins, then you need to have a different calibration curve because the polarizability of these molecules is slightly different from the polarizability of um, proteins. So one would have to generate um, a, a different calibration curve. So what are the applications of this technique? Well, we can determine mass in solution um, and typically using around 10 to 100 nanomole um, solution and a, and a sample volume of 10 microliters. Um, obviously, we can um, determine mass um, above this lower threshold of around 50 kilodaltons. So we can determine sample heterogeneity, that's as a, the mass heterogeneity. We can look at self-association, so we can look at mon whether there's monomer, dimer, trimer, tetramer, um, we can look at interact, hetero interactions between two, two different molecules. We can also look at less desirable forms of interactions like aggregation. Um, the way that it's been used in the LMB um, has been to look at the assembly of large um, complexes. And this might be looking for solution conditions where these complexes are more stable in that we're able to see the mass of the assembled complex rather than the components, or where people have used cross-linkers to try and stabilize complexes prior to cryo-EM um, um, measurements. We can also look, although we um, less so, we haven't done much of that here, but certainly this is an application of the um, instrument is to look at protein modifications such as glycosylation. Um, it will obviously work with other biopolymers and nucleic acids um, have been studied. And you can see the references down below here. Um, and very interestingly, recently, last year, there was a proposal to use this technique to use map um, to determine mass in immobilized bilayers. And this is a very interesting application that we, we hope to um, advance here in the LMB. In this case, on your cover slip, you would have an immobilized bilayer, and therefore the contrast that you see is the event where a protein 
lands and enters into this um, immobilized bilayer. But then having entered the bilayer, the molecule will likely remain within the bilayer, but it will be able to diffuse within the bilayer. So as well as determining the mass, because we're able to observe the contrast of the, of the molecule within the bilayer, we can look at its diffusional properties using a process of particle tracking. Um, and then on top of that, one could then consider adding in additional proteins and looking at how they interact with the initial protein that you've embedded in the bilayer. And there's a reference here, and there have been a few papers published um, using this approach. And so this is really quite interesting. Um, people have also claimed that you can actually determine KDs um, of assembly, and it would be in the low nanomole kind of range. I'm not totally convinced by that, and I can discuss with people in more depth if they're interested in that. But the main um, application of this technique arises from the fact that it's extremely quick to do. It just takes a few minutes. It uses only microliters of nanomolar concentration sample, and we don't require any labels. So it really, for that reason, um, has great appeal. Here's just an example of some data we've collected um, on the instrument here, using 15 microliters of 50 nanomole, measuring for a minute. And in this case, both of these two proteins are dimers, sorry. Um, and um, in this case, um, on the left, we have a heterodimer, um, and the sequence mass for this heterodimer should be 208. We observe a maximal um, or some sort of distribution. And if we fit this to a Gaussian, we get a, a, a median or an average mass of 205. And the molecular weight, or sorry, the mass of the individual components are down here. So we can see little, if any, population of the component monomers. In this case here, we have a homodimer. This would be where the dimer would be. And again, we get pretty good agreement between the observed mass and the expected mass. So we can see that um, this kind of technique allows us to immediately determine, first of all, our dimer is able to assemble and it's stable at, at this kind of concentration, 50 nanomole. Um, and we have very low levels of polydispersity, other components, both aggregates and also the monomer components. So finally, I'll talk quickly about the um, C-trap um, that we are um, in the process of having um, installed in the building at the moment. Now, C-trap uses um, optical tweezers and the instrument we have has two, two of these um, trapping um, lasers that can catch particles. Um, and it can be used in simple force um, extension or force clamp measurements where we're interested in the amount of force um, that the molecule can resist or apply or, or how that changes. But also we have an additional um, element in that you can image where you're um, holding your molecules between these optical tweezers, in our case, using wide field turf or reflectance microscopy options. And this allows you to um, look at interactions and dynamics within your system. So the, the um, phenomenon of optical trapping um, relates to the fact that um, interaction or scattering with a particle leads to a change in the momentum of light. Um, and therefore there's a force that acts on that particle, which drives the um, particle towards the um, area of light where you have highest intensity. So when you have a very tightly focused laser beam, you are able to hold particles at that, at that focus. This was um, um, this um, property and um, the um, resolution of the mechanism of what was happening resulted in the Nobel Prize to this guy Ashkin in 2018. And from what I remember, I think he was 94 when he got this Nobel Prize. So never give up, even when you've retired, you're probably still in with a chance of, of getting the, um, some sort of large prize. Um, anyway, um, 
in the technique we typically or it's typical to use functionalized polystyrene beads which allow tethering of biopolymers between these two optical traps for example we might use streptavidin coated beads um, and the kind of sizes of the beads are between half and, and 10 microns. What's really nice about this instrument is it has a sophisticated laminar flow system. And this allows you to assemble your um, experimental um, platform using um, um, in a stepwise manner. So here you can see a schematic of the uh, typical flow chip that the company supply and you can see there are five um, um, flow channels and these channels are fed from syringes but at a rate way and um, relating also to the dimensions of the flow channel the rate at which solutions are flowing through means that the flow is laminar what laminar flow means is that although you have no physical barrier between the two flowing channels they, the mixing of the two channels tends to be very slow or non-existent. So what that means is you can have different conditions within five different, in, if you look at this blue region, these um, within here, you could have potentially five different flowing channels with different conditions. So here you can see a schematic where you would initially pick up the beads in the first channel using the optical trap. You'd use the optical trap to bring the beads into a, a flow channel where the DNA was passing. You would then capture, for example, DNA between them. Um, and then you could move into channels where you could have a protein that interacts with the DNA, another protein. And then you could take it into an experimental channel where you could do force um, extension or um, other types of measurement. So, um, this means, sorry, that um, this means that um, what we can do is trap um, some biopolymer between these two um, immobilized beads, and then uh, we could consider looking at um, nucleic acids. We could look at structure. We could look at organization and repair and editing and transcription by adding the appropriate uh, molecular machinery into our system and um, we could immobilize proteins we could consider looking at folding conformational changes or, or studying idps and once we have our molecules between the traps we can look at how these uh, properties um, the physical force um, properties which um, of these molecules how they're altered by interactions with other proteins interacting with them. We can do both force clamp or force extension type experiments. We can also then on top of that image the system and we have the wide field turf and reflectance microscopy option. Within Cambridge there's another C-trap system that um, has confocal imaging and we can also access that system if we, if we want to or if we uh, pay for um, access. We have three color fluorescence excitation. And then if you think about imaging uh, fluorescence from um, this um, excitation, we can do dynamic measurements as a function of time where we simply hold the molecules between the optical traps. And then we watch how our fluorescently labeled molecules move on the macromolecule that we're holding. We could then look at how they move when we change the um, force on the molecule, or we could add additional molecules and so forth. Or we could then, for example, initiate a reaction adding ATP or take it into a channel where we collate, collate out magnesium or, or so forth. So these dynamic measurements with time generate so-called chymographs. Um, we could also think about having an immobilized um, biomolecule of interest and then um, looking at um, the, the trap being an actual cargo onto the, for example, a motor and looking at how these move on immobilized filaments. The company are also promoting the use of um, um, this technique to actually trap 
vesicles or phase separated protein droplets and then look at how these um, come together if you bring them close enough fusing and so forth of, of these um, droplets. So here's just an example of um, um, an experiment that's done um, by a friend of ours or a colleague in um, Imperial College. In this case they're looking at Cas9 and here you can see they have DNA between the beads and Cas9 binds in a, a particular on target position within the DNA that they're um, holding between the beads. And at low force, what they see is only the um, binding to the on-target position. Whereas um, when they apply force, they see um, that um, they, they see a lot of off-target Cas9 binding. In this case, Cas9 is carrying this green label. So here you see uh, low force on target binding. And then as they start to apply the force, they see the recruitment of a lot more um, Cas9 to the DNA. And this is occurring at off target sites. Very interesting paper, well worth a read. And there's a lot more detail in how they um, evoke the uh, idea that the, uh, the DNA is bubbling um, to allow this off target binding. Is another very interesting paper published last year, which gives a sort of very generic workflow using the spy catcher system to immobilize uh, proteins, um, in this case, um, for work between or use in an optical trap system. Um, I won't go into the detail, but it, 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 um, you can have a look at the paper and um, um, it, it seems to me to give a very generic way of um, including or, or uh, coupling in um, molecules of interest to uh, a cassette-like system for, the use, for this technique. One of the very interesting things also about this paper is that the protein that was studied here, which contains these spy tags, was generated by in vitro translation. Um, that's because they needed very little of that protein produced. And so this particular technique might be something that could be used to um, study difficult to express um, systems. Here's the C-trap um, that we have in the building at the moment. So I can't really tell you any more or show you any data that we've acquired. So the key points of what I tried to get across, single molecule, molecule techniques are extremely powerful, but you should be careful that you are using them to address a specific trap question because they can be very technically challenging. They use very little material and this has many advantages but there are also additional disadvantages to having to work at very low concentrations and sometimes these may mean that single molecule approach um, is not really possible. So FCS is a technique you need fluorescent labels. We're looking at freely diffusing systems. So, and we're going to be able to determine size and conformation and also these nanosecond to microsecond interchain dynamics. And FRET, we need, again need fluorescent labels. We're looking at freely diffusing systems and we're able to determine distances between the donor and the acceptor and therefore populations which relate to conformation. ISCAT is a label-free walk-up system. It's totally in solution, although obviously we rely on a surface interaction to generate the event, the contrast, and we can get the mass, and from the mass we can observe populations, um, ensemble populations. The C-trap is very, very powerful and can do a whole variety. It can, it's fluorescence or label-free. It's in solution, although one, molecule, one part of your system is trapped. And, um, we can study force and mechanical properties, but also look at interactions, dynamics and movement and so forth on the trapped molecule. So if you want to put any questions that you have into the Q&A, I will try and address them, or you can approach me at any time or email me. And there are a few references here, um, which um, I are, pretty um, recent and which um, describe 
um, variety of single molecule approaches, including the ones that I've covered. Um, further information can be gathered from the earlier talks um, and um, the talk by Stephen on fluorescence, which was on Tuesday. So if there are any questions at all, I will. All right. Um, gosh, OK. With the C-trap system we got for the LMB, what kind of protein DNA interaction experiments could we do? Well, um, I think as far as I know, obviously, <laughs> um, <laughs> since we haven't um, been trained uh, on the instrument. Uh, as far as I understand, we should be able to make pretty well any, any type of measurement that you wish. Um, if not, the idea behind um, the type of imaging that we have is that uh, we can access the instrument in the biochemistry department, and they may well have systems which they Knee, which would be most optimally um, addressed using wide field or, or turf. Um, and therefore we will trade um, time on the two instruments. So um, that's not really an answer, but um, get back to me again and I will address that once we've been trained and um, which will be shortly. The ISCAP technique is really interesting as it's very quick and uses low protein concentration. I'm surprised it's not more, more widely used. How do you compare SEC moles and ISCAP for molecular weight determination? What are the pros and cons comparing them? Okay, very good question. Um, So um, how do you compare SEC moles and ISCAP for molecular weight determination? Well, they should give the same um, molecular weight. Um, in the case of SEC moles, your polydispersity within the, um, your sample is resolved um, on the size exclusion column, hopefully. Um, and therefore you determine the mass from individual components eluting from that size exclusion. Whereas in ISCAT, you observe all sizes of particles or masses of particles um, simultaneously. That is then the reason why it is so quick. Um, the real um, contrast between the two um, techniques is that um, the concentration um, window that you have with ISCAT is limited to roughly 100 nanomolar of um, particles or events, if you want to call them. Um, so whatever your predominant molecular species is, be it monomer, dimer, or tetramer, you need to have roughly 100 nanomolar of those particles. Oh, that's roughly the upper limit. And this um, translates to a somewhat limited or, or slightly more limited um, protein concentration. In the case of SEC moles, the dynamic range of those measurements is almost unlimited, particularly if you use refractive index as your concentration source. Um, and in that case, you can measure um, samples at 20, 30 mg per mil, if you so wish. And that might have um, implications in terms of some other orthogonal experimental approach that you're using, such as crystallography or, or otherwise. Um, I am also surprised it's not more widely used. Um, I think perhaps um, we're, we're trying to promote it as a technique. Um, and it is also very simple to use. Um, and um, it's very easy to train people to um, obtain data on it. Other disadvantages to the ISCAT is it doesn't tolerate other potentially noise in terms of reflection generating components in solution. So things like detergents um, and high concentrations of 
glycerol or other components tend to be problematic in that they, although they're, they're often not big enough to come into the molecular mass measurement range, they generate noise and all of the noise piles up around 50 um, kilodaltons. So that can be quite problematic. On, in contrast, SEC moles is quite happy to work with those um, additional um, additives. And also you can even get additional information about how much detergent, for example, is complexed um, with your protein. Yeah, okay, so that kind of answers in some way um, your question. Um, just to follow on from that, um, it's my habit whenever I do SEC moles um, to also take a small amount because you need so little of the sample and have a look on the ISCAT to see whether you can measure it and what you, what you see. If there are no other questions, thank you very much for coming and um, 